I just I have I have had a long career, 25 years at the Bank of Canada, 16 years at the IMF. I left in April 2021 to carve out a career in the CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency Advisory business. These papers along the side are the um, kind of mark the my involvement while I was the IMF in this Central Bank Digital Currency space, uh, going back to well, there's a 2018 paper that I was part of the team wrote that, but uh, I guess my interest in fintech and CBDC, digital currencies, crypto and so on goes back to around 2012 or so. And I was one of the pioneers of the IMF and started um, tracking tracking um, developments in, in that, that space. Of course, now when I talk to my colleagues at the IMF, ex-colleagues at the IMF, it seems like everybody's on this topic. Central bank digital currency especially is of great interest to the IMF um, and and the, the the client countries that it uh, it services. So without further ado, let's move on to the first slide, which gives a it's a chart that shows the the degree of central bank retail central bank digital currency experimentation by the year that they launched their their project. So you can see, you know, back in 2013, there was only a handful that were focused on. And retail CBDC. I should underscore retail because uh, these are CBDCs that are meant for general purpose usage, as opposed to what they call wholesale CBDC, which I'm not really going to cover in any depth today. But that's a CBDC that is aimed more at um, the interbank um, um, transactions and so on, large value, low frequency transactions. But what we're talking about today is retail, which is you know, small, high frequency transactions. So you can see now there's about well, I think there's 94 countries that that have or recently ha are are or have recently been exploring um, CBDC. Um, back in 2018, I showed you that paper at the beginning where we we launched that IMF paper way back then. There was about uh, was about uh, 20, 27 or 28 countries that were were um, exploring. And I should underscore that everything that I know and I talk about, I'm kind of a stickler on this, is based on publicly available information and so could be that we're missing some particularly emerging market development economy countries tend to be a little bit shy about their their efforts or their communication efforts are are, are not well established so they don't really have a they could have a comm department that can send out uh, detailed press releases regarding their work others actually a little bit afraid that there's a pr problem with uh, CBDC because it's digital currency and it sounds like cryptocurrency and there some central banks fear that um, if it becomes known that they're dabbling in the topic, um, everyone's going to get excited that they're going to be perhaps uh, launching a cryptocurrency or perhaps making Bitcoin legal tender, which is a kind of a hot topic in some countries. But as you can see, it's it's quite the growth industry um, and. Uh, and I'm, I'm expecting it to grow even further. And pro much of that growth being not actual real startups or projects, but the central banks um, becoming more visible in, in their efforts. Perhaps some of the countries that I don't follow out of the blue launching a CBDC. So in term, I like to start by defining exactly what a, a CBDC is. And I kind of like to first of all start with dropping the CB first of all. So retail digital currency isn't entirely novel. It's, it's essentially um, an e-currency or e-money e um, that's issued by a central bank. And this this point in my presentation has changed over the years because when I started doing this presentation, I you made cash my comparison. I would say that a central bank digital currency is a is a is a central bank um, is, a, is is a is a digital is a is a is cash um, that's been transformed into a digital. Um, digital version by the central bank. But you'll see later that uh, that's not the, really the way the CBDC product has evolved. It's not really as cash-like as some people would like. So anyways, this so I like to start with this slide just to anchor expectations. So we're talking about e-money that's issued by the central bank. And this is a detailed slide where I try to run through the key characteristics of a central bank digital currency, particularly retail CBDC, um, and compare it to other forms of um, digital currencies and digital money. And so that shaded portion is kind of what I call the, uh, the, the fundamental characteristics of a CBDC. First of all, it's denominated in the jurisdiction's unit of account. So 
you won't get the you know the Bank of Japan will not be issuing what they could call a CBDC if it was denominated in U.S. dollars or 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 a Mexican peso or whatever. It's it would have to be denominated in the country's unit of account. In most cases, that unit of account is the same thing as the country's uh, legal tender. And then, and this is the important part, the CB part. It's backed by and issued by a direct liability of the jurisdiction's um, monetary authority or central bank. And you notice I don't use the word country there. I, I do that purposely because um, some people that track CBDC efforts count countries. And that means that when you come to uh, countries in the Eurozone, you're going to end up um, tw counting 20 countries as being um, central bank digital currency explorers. But I just count one because the your your ECB European Central Bank is the sole legal issuer of um, of of a CBDC or any kind of um, central bank issued currency. Although some of the member national central banks might do their own experiments and dabble a little bit in sand, what they call sandboxes, but the ultimate issuer can only be in the case of Europe, let's say the, the ECB. And then being retail, it's an, it's broadly accessible to the public for general purpose usage. So those are your four. Um, key characteristics, and then there's that slightly lighter um, gradient part that uh, says basically that the the digital currency um, is fungible. I might also add there um, a, available for peer to peer transactions, so it's not like a credit or debit card, which is only useful for um, um, dealing with the directly with vendors and so on, but but it can be used for paying payments between people. That's that to me is a pretty important um, distinction. And uh, it'd be fungible with other forms of recognized currency in the economy. So that means it's interchangeable with um, commercial bank deposits and, and, and so on. It's, it's basically interoperable with all the other major payments. And then there's, a, there's lighter, there's the unshaded parts, which is that uh, it'd be subject to the same rules and regulations as the jurisdiction's other units of account. And that's really just essential. That means it's, it's subject to the same uh, AML, um, anti-money laundering, um, countering the financing of terrorism um, rules and regulations that, uh, you know, for instance, the, most countries limit the amount of cash that you can, or they don't limit, but they, when you, it, when you, t when you draw down a deposit that's a larger than a certain amount of um, certain level, um, you have to have, there you face certain re reporting requirements and so on to conform to those AML CFT standards. And then the last one, it's, does it run on distributed ledger technology or blockchain? And I, I make this very clear here that it's, it's not necessarily so. As many will think that, okay, a CBDC is necessarily running on blockchain or DLT rails, but it's it's not true. Um, it's, it's, and I'll show you later that um, there's the, 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 the countries and central banks that are piloting CBDC, uh, some are running on, on DLT rails, some are not, so they're all over the place. You'll see the extreme right hand side I do have it's not a retail but um, I've got that wholesale CBDC which has shares many of the characteristics of the retail CBDC but is not broadly accessible to the public for general purpose usage now you notice there for wholesale CBDC I ticked that box for runs on DLT because a point I like to make is that wholesale CBDC actually is not anything particularly new um because uh, arguably you know the the are real time growth settlement systems, payment systems that are run by the central bank, those are already digital payment rails. So they're already effectively CBDC. So CBDC has been available in the wholesale space ever since uh, we've had um, bank accounts running on digital rails. I mean, that would go back into the 1960s or 70s or something, something along those lines. What's new now when we talk about wholesale CBDC is they are running on on. DLT rails and taking advantage of some of the some of the features of DLT um, that uh, they're useful in the wholesale space. I'm thinking there of smart contracts, atomic swaps, and that sort of thing, which I'm not going to get into. Today. That's almost a whole other lecture, but um, those are kind of the exciting parts of DLT that uh, they're in the wholesale CBDC space. And so I'm not going to go through all the other comparisons, but you'll see that there's also a, a column there called synthetic retail CBDC and for those of the even though it's what a stable coin is a synthetic CBDC is a is a stable coin that's instead of being backed by um, commercial bank deposits or other um, risk risk low risk liquid assets it's backed by um, deposits at the central 
bank and arguably Alipay and WeChat Pay are, re are synthetic retail CBDC because their reserves are held at the People's Bank of China. So that, that, that one, you could almost say that that retail CBDC, synthetic retail CBDC is already in the wild. And there's a few other countries that, that require their, their e-money providers to, to park their funds at the central bank. So those would be arguably um, synthetic retail CBDC. And you'll see I've got retail GovCoin. It's the, that's a name I've invented, but uh, it's been essentially, it's, it looks almost like a CBDC, but it's issued directly by the government. And I know of only one instance of that right now, at least in the experimental phase, the Pacific Island of Palau is, in, is uh, contemplating, um, the, the government's contemplating issuing a stable coin backed by US dollars there because they're, they're, their legal tender and unit of account is the US dollar. They don't have a central bank um, because of that. They don't need a central bank uh, because they don't actually offer up their own their own currency. So the government's contemplating issuing a stable coin backed by presumably deposits at the Fed or with com with commercial banks. Obviously with commercial banks that wouldn't be um, that wouldn't be what I would call a gov coin. I think it needs to be backed by bought deposits at the um, at a central bank, the relevant central bank. Moving on, so I'm going to use the IMF's what they call the five P approach to CBDC project management to describe the different phases of development of CBDC because they run all the way from launched or in production to just being in the research phase. So ones that are in the research, pure research phase, and that would be desk research. We would call that the preparation phase of their project. And then they move on from there if if they decide that they they do want to move on they move on to doing proof of assumptions and effectively those are proof of concepts where um they try different technologies in a kind of lab setting some of them go as far as in fact to have a proof of concept that say runs with the staff of the central bank the um, central bank of ukraine did a proof of concept where they involved um, all their staff, the central bank staff, um, to test out the wallet, the mobile wallets and that sort of thing. Then you move on to prototypes where you've kind of narrowed down your choice of technologies and, 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 you're, start, and you're really building out something that you plan to possibly launch as a pilot. That's the fourth P. And the pilot is where you essentially go out and it's like a pre-launch almost of the CBDC where you, you but it does involve real people like the and sometimes it involves a whole country sometimes it involves just little slices of the country and you'll i'll talk a bit more about those different permutations of combinations in a minute then you go into production where it's launched so that's how i i build up this table which i you can see the bottom i i have, there's a link to my my web page where i keep this up to date almost in real time so you can see here i'm just going to move something on my screen here Okay, so you can see we got 94 altogether that have launched the pilot being explored. Um, and I say plus two because at the bottom, you've got uh, two CBDCs that were uh, were launched and then discontinued. So you have Finland in, from 92 to 2006 and Ecuador from 2014 to 2018. And I like to use Finland as the example that shows that, that um, retail CBDC doesn't necessarily involve um, blockchain because it launched in 92 and that's of course some years before um, Satoshi um, published his white paper so and that and that particular CBDC is not based at all on DLT technology but it's arguably the first retail CBDC but moving to the top you can see there's nine countries that have either launched or, or piloted or are piloting um, um, CBDC so in terms of launches, um, the Palmas uh, was the first to launch. They, they call their, their CBDC the $10. And then got Jamaica, they've also they launched um, early in early 2022. So you've got basically, and, and three, Nigeria is the, the, the third third one out there. They're, they're, sometimes the, the difference between pilot and launch is a bit slippery. And, and I'm not even sure if Nigeria has publicly, the Central Bank of Nigeria has publicly said we have launched, um, but uh, they, they they launched a pilot that sort of in the press release said it was pilot, but it was pretty obvious that it was more like a soft launch uh, to to do it gradually. And so um, I think it's, it's it, we can call that a launch now. But um, we have a 
a number of them that have completed too. Well, Uruguay completed a pilot. This is some time ago, I think 2018 or so. Um, they Some people assume they've shut down their efforts, but I think they've just sort of put their efforts on hold for a while, largely for the same reason a lot of things got put on hold, COVID and so on. And so they've put their, sort of parked their efforts. But uh, so you can see here, there's nine that are, that are quite active. China's probably the, the one that gets the most, attracts the most attention or has up till now, I'd say that uh, India is also, who they just launched about a month ago, they launched their pilot. So that's being watched closely, but China's got a kind of real, I'd say like from a best practices project management perspective is running, is probably running the, the perfect pilot in that they're, they, they're trying all sorts of different th permutations and combinations of technology, trying it in different places, trying it with different um, user groups and so on. So that they're and including doing they have an offline version of their CBDC, which is quite innovative. And so they and they and they actually uh, piloted some of that technology at the the Winter Olympics last year. So they've got a super active pilot. So and and I think um, they're expected to launch fully sometime in the next year or two, but not not quite sure. China's not the most transparent of uh, of countries, so we don't know completely what's going on there. But then uh, below that, you have the uh, you have 16 central banks that are running um, proof of concepts or, or soon will, and that there's a lot of them. And this is where things get kind of blurry because I've got this other thing where I'm saying that they they're in the advanced stages of research and development, and that's uh, we don't you know they, they I can't can't I have to believe that most of those are doing proof of concepts. Also, they're not just doing desk research they're actually experimenting with different technology i mean i use canada as a kind of a case in point that if you if you're on linkedin and you follow the bank of canada you'll see that they've been frequently hiring um technical people that could only be used for for um doing proof of concept work they're they're hiring people who are experts in cryptography and so on so that i imagine that um, many of those seven in the research and develop the advanced research and development group are are doing proof of concepts. And even the, the next group, the big glob here, 54 countries, there's a, there's a, there's different degrees of advancement in these different efforts. So, you know, it's probable that so there's many of these are also doing proof of concepts and could be launching out of the blue anytime. You'll see that some of these have crosses through them. And I did that because I'm not sure, because you don't really know when, when a central, central banks announce when they're starting the research, but they don't necessarily announce when they've decided that CBDC is not for them or they discontinue the research. But th my guess is that like Denmark and Switzerland, they've kind of parked their, their serious CBDC work after deciding it's not really um, for them. But uh, there could be others in, and that's why I have the dates on there because the dates tell when you have the last update. So Iceland was last updated in 2018. And so that's a, that would be a case where and I, I, um, I would suspect that they've parked their, their research, but it could surprise me any day. Who knows? And then you've got the other group, that second from the bottom of six, where, because I my preference is to, because you can see there's a link. These are all links. And you can, when you, when you go to that website, you can click on one of those countries and it'll take you to the relevant announcement. In the case of those six near the bottom, um, uh, they sent, those are the shy central banks. They don't. We, we're pretty sure, certain that they are doing CBDC work. work. And it's, it's coming from reputable news sources, and, and often, you know, I have a little bit of inside information that can confirm that, in fact, they are doing some some CBDC research. So that's uh, that. This sort of brings brings us up to that uh, 94, which I expect to just keep growing. And it's kind of funny that this. I'm I'm packing all this into the page with a really tiny font. I can just uh, imagine them doing the same presentation in a year from now. I'm going to have to go down to some kind of a legible um, font. We'll see. John, one one question came up here, and when you, you framed it as uh, focused on on retail CDPCs, but uh, a rough idea how you think this would map out for a wholesale CDPCs. That's you could anticipate my next slide, and here it is. I, this is my only slide I have on wholesale CBDC, and this is a. These are all the projects that I know of, and, and I divide them into 
three groups. There's a, there's a bunch of projects um, and, and they tend to be the earlier, earlier projects in the, in the wholesale CBDC space that were focused on um, domestic payment system, essentially um, considering running um, the, the country's payment system um, on, on um, blockchain rails. The next one focuses is a whole bunch that focused on um, cross-border payments, and that's probably one of the most active and interesting parts of the wholesale CBTC space. You'll see the BIS plays a big role in that, that where they're running all sorts of different projects that are looking at different permutations and combinations of using wholesale CBDC to uh, um, um, to, to make cross-border payments more efficient. And then they've got another group where it's focused on security settlements. And that's, that's um, again, BIS plays a big role in all of those. And just going back to the top, I mean, my my take on the all the all the projects that focused on, focused on domestic payments, um, the conclusion will, generally has been that uh, yeah, it works. It's pretty. It works very well. But it doesn't it doesn't offer up an, a major incremental benefit over existing um, um, digital payment rails that they've already got in place. As I said before, wholesale CBDC is nothing new. So they they've got a obvious benchmark for comparing. The, these new wholesale CBDC based systems, and so um, they. I think the only one that's that I can is kind of new to the game is the, the Republic of the Philippines. Um, they've they just launched a, a project last year focused on wholesale CBDC. Actually, they've been flip flopping all over the place for some years. They were first of all focusing on retail CBDC, but decided that they really weren't. That really wasn't where they were going to get their biggest bang for the buck. So they. They've now started up a project looking at uh, improving the domestic payment system using wholesale and CBDC. But they're the lone one out there that's still working actively in that area. But these other projects, um, the cross-border ones and the security settlement um, projects, they're going full full tilt here. And I think that, for instance, I, I'm, I'm particularly interested and involved in the security settlement space and there's that um, one at the bottom called project helvetia that was run by the swiss national bank and that's a that's almost a production ready um settlement system it's uh, working with the six uh, six uh, um, st um digital stock exchange um in that pilot and you know it worked like a, a charm and, and it's really just a matter of getting all the legal legal um things in place to, to actually issue um, a wholesale CBDC that would operate with the with the the stock exchange. So I mean I don't know where they're going to get that authorization, but that's the the persist. It worked it worked very very well, and it was a grand success. The other ones, uh, the, in the middle group, the cross border ones. I mean, amongst all of those, I think the one that intrigues me the most is the is that MCBDC bridge, um, which involves sort of a hub and spoke approach where each country central bank issues a wholesale CBDC, but gets the the cross-border payments get cleared through a centralized hub. But as I keep telling people, we talk about interoperability and so on. The technical part of interoperability is often the easy part of, of developing these systems that where different CBDCs and digital currencies can speak to each other. The much harder part is the all the legal and regulatory aspects. And I think that's what we may see happen with the the MCBDC or CBDC bridge project that technically I think it's it's actually looking very promising but the next phase will be much more difficult for example one ch challenge is uh, you're going to have a hub and spoke approach who's going to be the hub you know is is, is the US fed going to give up uh, some control of its 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 cross current cross border currency work to um some hub that's based in in say Hong Kong or Singapore and there's even talk now for those that are really steeped in DeFi and so on, you know, the use of automated um, market makers to to actually um, so there would be almost like a stateless um, hub. So lots of interesting things happening there. But uh, and that's why, like I say, we we could almost have a lecture on each, particularly the, not so much the first cluster, but we could have a whole session on cross border payments and then another one on security. They're both um, very rich topics. But as I, again, you can catch the updated version of this table time by going to that uh, link at the bottom. Uh, in terms of the stated, oh, yeah. 
just one question on, on that came in. So if, if you look at the platforms, Ethereum is the only public uh, blockchain on there and everything else is a private consortium. So it's just the nature of the beast that when you go into wholesale payments that it's a silver vault garden, right? Yeah, I think if we did a deep dive into the into that reserve bank of Australia, one that uses Ethereum, um, you'd find that they're using some kind of um, some kind of private consortium based version of that. It's it's just like a, it's like a plan for the central banks that applies to retail CBDC too. Um, got pestered about this on social media a lot. Uh, like when is someone going to do something on a public on permission blockchain? I I say it's very likely, but I mean I suppose there might be some small emerging market developing economy country that wants to thumb its nose at the rest of the central banking community and, and do that but it's it's uh it's highly that, uh, anyone's going to want a, a prediction vision based on on that because it's kind of like a mantra that the central bank has to has to control and and, and loosen loosen the control only very reluctantly because in the in this case the wholesale cbt space i think they're okay with one with a distributed um, Distributed ledger technology, as long as they're sharing the they're they're sharing the load with trusted um, counterparts, be the banks that are already involved in the payment system. The same for retail, um, to the extent they would have they would use DLT, and that's what we've observed in the pilots. The the um, um, the, the nodes would be distributed amongst these trusted counterparties, which so far are just banks. In fact, I think when the bank can they run they did run a public version I think of Ethereum for Jasper Phase One. But they were just doing that because I don't think it makes Ethereum popular is it's some open source and, and free. The, the, the IMF we ran uh, an internal proof of concept of a of a crypto and we ran it on, on Ethereum. And the reason was it was a very grassroots effort. It was actually just a bunch of Bunch of us staff that got together and decided to give it a shot, and we haven't budged. So that's why we've gone with with Ethereum. So I imagine that might be a the reason why these um are running on Ethereum. But if you go back to retail, no, we're all running on some kind of some kind of closed system. And I'll talk a bit more about technology if we have time at the end, where you'll see the how the retail DC forms are spread out. And in terms of stated policy goals, and again, this is retail. We're back to retail CBDC. You know, for that, I kind of divide the world into two parts: the developing and economies, uh, emerging market, and that first cluster tend to focus very much on financial inclusion, which makes sense because that's often they've got um, they've got a lot of unbanked people. They've got uh, don't have a, their banks aren't offering very many digital products, so they they want to jumpstart financial inclusion and efficiency. Um, usually. The that's just a code word and for many of these cases of trying to reduce um, the reliance of cash which for smaller countries is a is a very expensive and even risky risky um, type of currency to manage and they want to build out resilient systems that uh, can because often their infrastructure um, is a little bit bit shaky so they want to build out something that's more more robust and then the developing uh, um, the advanced economy countries I mean they share some of those same um, same goals, and they, you know they they do tick the boxes for resilience, um, but uh, that that's like that's like um, as I say in the U.S. Ma Pa and Apple Pie. You can't if a central bank didn't say it would wanted to have a resilient payment system, um, that would be a big faux pas. But they're very much focused on central bank bank money access, and that takes different forms. In the case of say Sweden, for instance, the concern is that um, almost nobody accepts or uses cash and the payment system has been dominated by one one digital payment service called swish and, and so there's also um monitor uh, monopoly concerns which is also a, a column in this in this table um and the other reason why and then europe for instance they're they're concerned about the encroachment of, of foreign uh, digital payment services like paypal and mastercard and visa and so on they want to push back on that china's concerned about uh, again the, the re the diminishing use of central bank money because everyone's using um, Alipay and WeChat Pay, and that, that's also 
presents a, a monopoly problem they, they want to break. In the case of Canada, when they talk about central bank money access, they, um, they, they're they talking about the encroachment of cryptocurrencies and stable coins to dominate in other currencies. And again, there, there would be concern about a potential monopoly distortions. You won't see Japan there because this table is based loosely around a paper that the one of the ones I showed on the front um, that uh, looked it, did a, it was a survey based paper of um, of of six central banks that were um, looking seriously at CBDC. I, I, and I, I've added a few in, in there. Those are the ones that are highlighted that were not part of that uh, that paper, um, but they're the ones that um, have, have have launched in the U.S. I guess I put them in there because I'm living here. I'm pretty close to that one, but. Uh, I don't think you'd find that the, I think Japan would probably fit very much in the same mold as say the, the USA in terms of its um, its motivations for uh, looking at retail CBDC, which would be you know, the concerns that diminishing use of central bank money would be probably a primary one there. But you know, quite frankly, you know, I'm a CBDC guy, um, but when people ask me like, am I, do I think CBDCs are the, you know, the best thing th since sliced bread and I'd have to say, I'm not so sure. And I think in a lot of countries, they've already got um, digital currency payment rails that are working just great. And and the um, and the way the, the proof is in the pudding in that all those pilots and launches I mentioned in that previous slide, the, the general consensus is they're not really going very well. They're, the uptake is not that great. And I, I suspect it is because they're being launched mostly in countries that already have well established, either have well established digital payment rails, or they don't, and it's because um, there's other issues that need to be dealt with before offering CBDC, like poor infrastructure, for instance. Uh, I think in Nigeria, uh, it is a problem that uh, they um, um, there's many people that don't have internet access, they don't have the smartphones need to run the digital wallets, and so on. And there's another issue, and I'm not going to talk much. At, I don't usually talk much about these, this, this particular kind of presentation, but the fact is that when you launch a CDC, there's a lot of pre-launch work you do. And part of that pre-launch work is is talking to stakeholders, which includes users, but also includes merchants and the banks you will rely on to distribute the CBDC. And in fact, I think I'm gonna get to the, this is, I'm just jumping ahead a little bit here, but the in terms of actual design of a CBDC, um, there's, there's three different, Broadly speaking, models. There's the what they call the unilateral CBDC, which is a direct CBDC, which is how most people would think CBDC works. So CBDC means I have accounts at the central bank. That's what's shown in the unilateral model. Nobody's actually looking seriously at that model because central banks really don't have a you know a, a comparative advantage in in dealing directly with the public. So they're all going to the what they call the intermediated CBDC. So they're involved in banks largely. Maybe in some countries they may end up using fintechs too. But the I think what happened in Nigeria is they they forgot about that part in the middle. They did not consult the banks that were expected to onboard customers and run digital wallets and so on. And, and so the banks are running putting a lot of friction on on the um, because they've, they've got already got competing products. They I mean they already have digital payment um, apps and all that sort of stuff. So they're the, they've got this central bank coming along and saying, for nothing, absolutely no compensation, we want you to help us roll out a CBDC that's going to eat your lunch. And, and they're not very happy about that. And I've talked to some of the commercial bankers in Nigeria, so they're actually, actually actively thwarting the Nigerian CBDC. But that's that's there's a number of reasons why I think that. Uh, um, that CBDC is going to be a tough sell in in many countries, but nevertheless, um, it's something that I, I enjoy tracking. So I'll continue um, continue doing that. So you'll see on this. Uh, um, I've also got below synthetic CBDC. That's so I mentioned that earlier. That's that essentially like a stable coin that's backed by central bank deposits. I, I'm I'm actually quite keen on this model, but so far, and the IMF is too. The IMF is written publicly. Um, um, advocating for this approach, where you basically um, make make payment systems run by either stable coins or by other e-money providers, make those those um, systems safer by offering them the opportunity to back their reserves at, at the central bank. So, 
I think that's that has promise, and I'm, I think I'm hoping, or maybe just guessing, that in a couple of years when I do this the same presentation, that I'll be talking a lot more about synthetic CBDC than intermediate intermediate. But we'll see. So we're now in the middle of the what I call the design section of my presentation. We talk about the different features that that uh, central bank digital currencies carry, and the first thing that um, the decision that has to be made is is there going to be are there going to be transaction fees, uh, and is there going to be are they going to be remunerated? And none of the launch or pilot CBDC so far um, charge transaction fees. And the philosophy there is kind of that, like, okay, with cash, with physical cash, we don't we don't pay to um, um, to to hold some physical cash. Mind you, when we go to an ATM withdraw, we, there might be some some fee there, but generally we expect. Um, cash to be free. So central banks have kind of continued that philosophy in their pilots and launches, so they don't have transaction fees. Some are talking about it. The Nigeria had said that they would uh, have a three-month period during which there'd be no transaction fees, and then they would start charging. But as far as I know, they they haven't. And you know, I think given the poor uptake, it would be not a great idea to start charging fees. But how does the central bank? compensate intermediaries and that's the question that the Nigerian central bank is is facing the, the banks say you know we'll help you out but where's the you know where's the money we need some we need to be compensated for all this work we're doing so it's kind of a thorny issue i suspect that in the end many central banks will have transaction fees at some level maybe not directly to the users but um you know may maybe I guess it would in fact, have to be to the users, I should, should, should say, but uh, they, someone's going to have to compensate the intermediary, so it's going to come out of somebody's pocket, and maybe the load will be balanced. I think Brazil is talking about possibly charging transaction fees if they offer CBDC, but they would be lower than the ones that are charged by, by the banks, but we'll see. The other, the other question is, should it be remunerated? In other words, should it be interest-bearing? So far, again, nobody has offered up an interest-bearing CBTC, and the reason is they usually say is that again we're going back to this sort of cash comparison. They're saying that they want CBDC to be uh, equivalent to M zero or base money, which um, is essentially cash, and that doesn't generally does not offer interest. So they don't want to muddy the waters by having an interest bearing version of of cash. But there are there are some arguments for um, paying interest. One is that uh, it's been popularized in the academic community as it could enhance monetary policy transmission um, because now you could you could make that interest float with the policy rate. And right now when a central bank changes the policy rate, it's transmitted sort of indirectly through the banking system. But if you had the if the CBDC were interest bearing, then the, you to get a direct impact right to the um right to the, the users. Also, and this doesn't seem so relevant in now, but the was relevant a few years ago is that um, if you want to have allow um, policy rates to go deeply into the negative territory, um, they right now if, if you go too deeply negative, people will just um, convert um, their their um, bank balances to to cash. Um, and so the um, by make, by if you could get everybody if you could get rid of cash and everyone holds CBDC, then you could um, you would be able to break that lower bound without fearing that uh, there would be this rush to to cash because the cash would be a CBDC and it would carry that same negative interest rate. The catch is you'd have to eliminate the use of cash or somehow make it costly, and both of those are really popular unpopular from a political point of view, and you'll see that most. I think all central banks, when they talk about CBDC design, they're very clear. Like in the first, the first paragraph they, of their opening speeches and so on, don't worry, we're not getting rid of cash. So that I think that's a nice theoretical uh, concept, but won't actually actually happen. But uh, also, remuneration is another reason for not not offering interest is that it increases some um, dis disintermediation and run risk, which is I think the next slide. Yeah, they and so. There's a fear that if you make essentially what we're saying here is if you make the CBDC too attractive, there's a risk that the banks could start losing deposits to the CBDC, which would obviously have negative impacts on the bank's ability to lend, and, and then that would flow into the, the economy. Um, also, it, 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 it can 
create some problems for the central bank because when the, when if everyone's switching out deposits into CBDC, that means the bank's balance sheet balloons in ways that are really hard to manage. And so, this is the way that's typically been um, in being mitigated is is by putting the holding and transaction limits on on the CBDC. Uh, particularly, the holding limits will limit the amount of. Uh, um, of disintermediations, we call it, that can take uh, place, and uh, and that's one one criticism of limits. Is if they're hard limits, what happens if, like, I'm I'm I've got a wallet, a CBDC wallet, that's actually right at the limit, but Norbert owes me some money for a coffee, so when he tries to pay me, I say, well, I can't take it because my 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 wallet's already topped out. Well, the 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 typical way that's that's done, that's that problem is solved, is that the the CBDC wallets are often linked in the waterfall, like a waterfall manner, to um, the, a bank account. So, if if Norbert pays me that that uh, for my for that coffee, they they immediately basically just just get transferred into my bank account, so that my my wallet doesn't become over over limit. And and these limits also play a run a run risk mitigation um, role too. There's the, essentially, run risk is like the accelerated version of disintermediation. Again, holding limits are, seem to be the way to, to go. Um, you know, although um, economists will say that um, if there's credible deposit insurance, why should there be run risk? But, you know, how many, does everybody really understand about how deposit insurance works? Um, and uh, and also in some of the developing countries, um, either they don't have deposit insurance or it's not credible or it's just started up and it's not very well funded so limits limit you'll see limits on all all the rollouts also another thing a place where limits and so on come into place and compliance with those um, FATF AML CFT CPF standards and it's kind of like a mantra that uh, CBTCs must comply with those FATF regulations with G7 paper published in 2021 that underscored um, that uh, and uh, so that that has uh, some different implications. So for instance, that compliance will require that there be information collected on users and there's a certain amount of transaction tracking that's done um, by say, competent authorities, but that would be central banks or, or financial integrity, as they call it, uh, authorities. Um, but there's some proportionality that the the FATF rules allow, which is being used um, in in these uh, CBDC designs. So, so typically, that uh, that proportionality is applied by reducing the data requirements on low value transactions, so that uh, they can be done either with uh, very low know your customer KYC rules, um, and may may have um, other features that make make that that small the small transactions more cash like than than e money like. So typically, there's what we call tiered holding and transaction limits. And in a couple of slides, I'll show you the exact way that actually works. In terms of privacy provision, central banks are taking what we call a data firewall approach. Typically, because you can run this intermediated um, architecture, the, the banks, just as they now can see quite a bit of what's going on in the payment infrastructure, the central banks cannot. The same approach with CBDC that the central banks may have access to some through anonymous data, uh, user data, but they um, they don't see the details unless they they unlock it with some sort of due process, usually be court order. And then, then there's there's a number of different other ways of the balance in user privacy and this financial integrity compliance. DCP it's just idea and non-transferable common non and anonymity vouchers that would allow users to have anonymous transactions up to a certain limit per month or something like that. And obviously they're non-transferable, so you can't sort of, if you don't want anonymity, you can sell it to somebody else. It'll be non-transferable. But there's also a couple of other um, technical solutions that enable cash like CBDC transactions. Um, and there's links here to the papers that, uh, that um, they're trying that approach, and you'll see the, a famous name there uh, has also proposed a system uh, in a paper that you with the Swiss National Bank um, that allows for a, a, um, the, the central bank 
issue tokens, but they and they they really can't they can't track um, specific um, transactions between wallets. And uh, there's also um, e currency is a is a, it's a firm that um, offer operates the Jamaica CBDC launch and that um, that, that works on the on the basis of digital bear instruments that um, that do permit anonymous those small low volume transactions. But let's see the, the central bank see the big ones. Good slide. Okay, so the, these are the actual ways that um, the um, these are being rolled out. So you'll see that the common denominator here is that the um, is that there's a for low small transactions, small balances. Um, know your customer um, requirements and, and little very little. Uh, should we talk about tracking in the next slide? So you can see, like for instance, the People's Bank of China. All you need is a SIM card for low limit access. But if you want to, you want to have bigger transaction and holding limits, you have to supply full name, um, government issued ID, and, and have a bank account for those higher limits. That bank account being required for those waterfall um, waterfall aspects I, I mentioned earlier. I presume that for the SIM card access, once you hit your limit. You hit your limit. That's it. You have to go off to an ATM or somewhere to, to sort of offload in order to make some room to to be able to take on more money into the, the wallet. And then this is the this is the how central banks control and data access. Again, there's that approach where the CB the central bank can only see anonymized transaction data, and but they can they can fully observe um, the um, the um, Transactions with either a court order, or in the case of, say, Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, they fully trust the financial institution, the banks, to play the same role they already do in in um, in in um, complying with um, financial integrity um, standards. And cross-border CBDC. That's I, I didn't dwell on that in the la in that slide talking about motivations, but often they will say that they want the CBDC to be cross-border enabled. Um, but no one, none of the launches or pilots have actually implemented that, and that's because it's really tough. First of all, there's the technical challenges, um, and then the other one is um, the regulatory um, and, and uh, standards um, in, interfaces and and, and um, conformity. And that's why I was when when a central bank would ask me, oh, "How can we design our country's CBDC to be cross-border enabled?" I say, "You know, hang on, wait until wait for the G7." FSB, the BIS Innovation Hub, to complete their work on making the wholesale rails more efficient. Because I just think it's really hard to to design a, a retail CBDC that's interoperable with all your neighbors' other retail CBDCs. It's it's been done in the e-money space. I think several places in Southeast Asia they've done bilateral between countries, but that wasn't a, the, the problems. The challenges weren't so technical. They were more like regulatory. Um, compliance and so on. Those were the things that were hard to align. So, I say, let's let's just put cross-border retail CBDC on on hold for now and wait for the efforts of the um, the BIS Innovation Hub and its partners. And then the other thing I like that it, the programmable CBDCs of hot top using smart contracts and so on. And we've got the IMF tap programmable CBDC for financial inclusion. Left side and the right side, um, you've got the reaction from people concerned about privacy and control, and the idea of of um, a CBDC that can control how you spend your money, who you can you can, and there's even talk of a CBDC that would have expiry dates and people to spend it and so on. And it's, I'd say it's like the idea of limited cash is terribly politically unpopular, and so so far I haven't I've not seen any retail CBDC rolled out. You know, for festooned with smart contracts and programmable and restrictions and so on, it's just it's not not a politically popular thing to do. John, and then we get to the uh, everyone's favorite topic. Oh, yeah. One, one question that fits into pro programmability. So, I mean, so far we're treating payment events as discrete events, right? It it happens once, and you can can make them recurring. But technically, we're able, and, and the protocols are supported already, that you basically stream money. And, and the use case, if you pay, is like you pay insurance premiums, for example, rather than 12 monthly payments, you continuously stream basically 
whatever, every, every second, every hour. And on the receiving end, you could do the same for a salary, for example, right? Rather than getting paid on the last Friday of the, the month, you continuously, at least daily or so, you, you get paid what, what you earned. And uh, is that part of, of any thought experiments, at least at this point? Um, I mean, that, that, I haven't seen that talked about in the context of smart contracts and programmable money. That's probably in, doesn't is it probably that's overkill to do it that way i mean there's once everyone's on digital rails so i think you could conceivably change the way funds are distributed like right now the reason why in, in say even the u.s because of there's so many there's people that are unbanked or unregistered when when the government was sending that stimulus money they sent out these checks in an ideal world that wouldn't be the case it would just go straight into people's accounts and you could do it like as a stream i think I think CBDC enables all those all those ideas. Uh, um, I don't think you need to have because one reason I'm dubious about programmability is that it it un undermines the fungibility of the which I sent earlier with a kind of fundamental thing. So I suppose that you know I owe you money. Maybe if if, if I've got like a small contract that's doing something like has an expiry date on my money, has that something else funky won't want that money I mean, maybe there's some way we can rig it so that once it passes to you the the, the smart contract reset or something but it adds a degree of complexity um it's on on, on warrant and, and and undermines that punchability so i'm i don't think we're going to go far with this idea of programmable contracted money that's just my i i think you can achieve the things you mentioned without necessarily in smart contracts in the CBDC itself, particularly if it's a, a, a what an account-based um, CBDC where there is a centralized ledger and so on, and, this, and so you know you could sign your you could sign up just like how you might sign up to have funds directly deposited in that account. You could have it. You could sign up to have it directly deposited into your CBDC account on a basis daily, weekly, or whatever. I'm just going to cut just when that, almost at the end of time here, but I want to just go because I think we're in this group. We're all familiar with blockchain DLT, but this is this is the the current map of which types of technologies are being used by who in the retail CBDC space. You can see that uh, the Bahamas, um, ECCB, um, and um, and also the Ukraine and Swedish experiments. They're they're running on DLT private permission, of course. But you'll see also that the uh, well, China is all a bit of a mystery, but you know, from what you, what I gather, um, they did try DLT um, for a while. Found it wasn't scale enough for them. Probably also maybe not as good for sur surveying um, user behavior and so on. So they've gone. They call it hybrid sometimes, but I think the basis of their their system is on a centralized ledger, as was the Ecuador um, um, launch they did some years ago. Not sure, but but Ghana is a proprietary platform that's run by. Uh, G and D, the big German banknote company. Um, Jamaica's got a unique um, platform based on a digital bear instrument. Um, so there's uh, that that's 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 virtually cash-like in the way that one works. And the Uruguay um, e peso pilot that was run on Roberto Giori's uh, centralized ledger. So they're all over the place in terms of where where um, the platforms are. And so that's the end of my my. So you can, I, I could, Norbert, I could send you the presentation so you can just do it to others and you'll see that they, I've got some references of my paper, papers. But you can also find all of these if you go to that, if you go to that tabulation on my web page I had earlier with all the retail CBDC experiments. At the end of that, I've got all of these references there too. So that's it. Any, any questions out there? I think we dealt with most of them as, the, as we went through. There was a tongue tongue and cheek question, but but obviously relevant when you were dropping off. Um, offline offline payments uh, was always a big big problem to solve, and some of the experiments certainly address that. What is the status there in, in your mind? 
Yeah, that's a, that's that's one of my favorite topics. In fact, you just on that first page, I've got one of my the companies I'm affiliated with was WhisperCash, which operates an offline um, digital currency platform. For me, I think, uh, particularly for um, emerging and developing economies, that uh, that especially poorer ones where infrastructure is not very good, you know, if if you offer offer a CBDC that doesn't have offline capabilities, you might as well just go home and pack your bags because that it's not gonna it's not gonna fly. You know, you. And also, if you're in a disaster-prone country, I think of like Puerto Rico. They uh, I can't remember which hurricane it was, but it like wiped out most of the country's infrastructure for weeks or maybe even months. And so you do need a, a backup plan. I mean, even the existing offline solutions aren't perfect because it's digital, right? It needs electricity. So if, if these in the short run, it, these offline solutions solve the problem of how do you how do you operate the system with no internet connection. But what do you do when there's no electricity? That's, of course, we're all in big trouble when that happens. But there actually are, are some solutions um, for that problem too. But I think I think it's essential. But China, as far as I know, is the only one that's currently has piloted an offline version of their CBDC. But the, there's a number of com companies that, are, and I should say, Ghana, um, the GND offers an offline um, solution that they're piloting in Ghana right now, quite successfully, apparently. But uh, I think I think that's going to be maybe one of the new innovations. Maybe not even just the CBDC space. I think it's kind of an innovation that should touch on all digital currencies.